And the following interview was conducted with Professor Carney, Professor Thomas Carney, Professor of Aviation Technology, and former head of the Department of Aviation Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on August the 27th, 2009 at his office on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Dr. Good Kelly. afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, let's start with, tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. I was born uh, in uh, Crawfordsville, Indiana in February of 1949 and um, grew up in the little town of Ladoga in southeast Montgomery County. Uh, my parents were Quentin and Alice and um, my dad was a veteran of World War II and actually retired from the Air Force Reserve as a major. He was a, um, an aircraft mechanic and an, a mechanic instructor in World War II and he was at Champaign, Illinois, doing mechanic training when uh, Pearl Harbor happened. And my parents were married during the war, and uh, my mother traveled. He didn't go overseas, so my mother traveled with him throughout the country, uh, mostly in uh, Kansas and Nebraska. Um, I'm an only child, and uh, so I grew up being an adult, I guess. <laughs> as an only child. Or spoiled as some people say. No, I don't think I was yeah, that. I think right. I was, I had to be an adult early on. What about your early years? Where'd your grade school and tell us about that and that as well as high school? Okay. Uh, in those days, each little community had their own school. So I went to Ladoga Grade School and then Ladoga High School. Were they separate? Actually, they were two buildings separated by a... Um, so they were in the same area? Yeah. Well, they were right next to each other. And a gymnasium in the back and it was the Ladoga Canners. And uh, my wife graduated from that same school a year later. And little schools like that didn't have a lot of extra type courses, but they had the foundation courses and they were really good places to learn. Be a good crowd. So that little school had, us, I think, produced a number of professors, teachers, doctors, the occasional attorney. Good. It was a good school. Were there any student clubs at that time that you could? What about athletics? Did they have little basketball or? Oh yeah, I, okay. I played basketball until oh, through junior high. I played uh, football, junior high and high school all the way through. Played uh, baseball in the summer, ran track. Um, so and it, it was a small enough school that most everybody who wanted to participate could do so. Could do so. Yeah. yeah, that's nice. Did they have a yearbook or a newspaper? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of nice. And yeah, uh, a lot of people work on those, you know, which is really kind of fun. Yeah, and they're a storehouse of, you know, fun pictures and treasures. <laughs> I know. Yeah. like the debris here. <laughs> yeah. But I was in the National Honor Society and probably the Science Club. And and then I worked during high school. I worked at a filling station, and in the summertime I baled hay and straw and worked on the farm, did even though I lived in a, town. Did your parents have a farm? Or no, they I lived in town, but okay. I, it was such a rural community that I sure. could work for farmers around. Good. Then tell us how you happened to select Purdue, and let's talk a little about your Purdue years. Um, well, actually, it's almost that Purdue selected me in a sense. Um, I uh, I was, as a junior in high school, thinking about did I want to go into science, nuclear physics? Did I want to be an engineer? I thought about being um, a brain surgeon. I had a lot of interests, most of them around science, but from the time I can remember, I wanted to be a pilot. And I was um, going into the study hall, a common area, big room there in the high school on the second floor, and they had a uh, bulletin board that had career information on it. And one caught my eye. It was a black and white picture, kind of a poster with a tear-off mailer, and it had a picture of one of the Purdue Aeronautics Corporation DC-6s on it. And that caught my eye because I had wanted to be a pilot for as long as I could remember. And I thought, gee, I ought to look at that. And it basically said, would you like to be a career as an airline pilot? If you're interested in aviation, send this card in, postpaid card, and we'll send you information. So I did, and um, true to form, within a month or so I had a packet from Purdue. And... Um, it really piqued my interest, and so I decided to apply. I decided that I really did want to be an airline pilot. In those days, in fact, that was that would have been 1966 or so. And in 1966, United Airlines was hiring people off the street, literally, who didn't have a pilot certificate, and they trained them at their expense. They didn't do that very long, and it wasn't terribly successful. But at the time, I was thinking, 
I was thinking, you know, I want to do that. And uh, ironically, uh, my dad was still in the Air Force Reserve, and his squadron met in the old Brown, I think it was called Brown River Company, uh, on uh, the Bypass and Union Street on the northeast corner. And they met there on Wednesday nights. And their commander was a gentleman by the name of Jim Maris. And so my dad's, uh, my dad's uh, colonel in the Air Force Reserve at the time was Jim Maris. And so he arranged with Professor Maris f- to have an interview for me and for a friend of mine who came along just to listen to see if he was interested. And I was honored to have that uh, interview. And as we got to... The, the interview underway, Professor Maris asked me how my grades were because then as now, the flight program is very uh, exclusive about getting into, uh, maybe even more so then than it is now. And so there weren't a lot of spaces for the applicants. And he said to me, how are your grades? And I had essentially all A's. I had one or two B's in high school, and that was it. So I, and I was third in my class. And so I said, well, I think they're pretty good. I have a, I don't know if it was a 3.8 or something like that, 3.9. And he, his smile faded, and it turned into kind of a frown. And he said, gee, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's not quite good enough. And I, I thought, boy, this really is selective. You know, I've got almost straight A's, and I'm not good enough to get in scholastically. And then he paused, and he said, now that's on a six point scale, right? Like Purdue was. And I said, oh, no, sir, that's on a four-point scale. And he brightened up and he said, okay, well, that sounds better, you know. And um, so I, um, I came up to get a, an FAA medical from uh, Dr. McFadden, who's passed away, but local physician and pilot. Came over, talked to Bill Duncan in the office that I was in for over 20 years as his associate department head later. Um, and was accepted, started in the fall of 1967. When I came, Purdue Air and Ice Corporation was still here. They still had the DC-3s and DC-6s. Um, in my junior year, Purdue Air and Ice Corporation went away and it became Purdue Airlines Incorporated. And they bought two DC-9s and they operated at least a third, all in the same color and, and said Purdue Airlines on the side, they were blue and white. I don't know how they got away without black not, and gold. For the research, this is not a commercial. Purdue Airlines was not commercial. Or was it? it was a non-scheduled carrier. It was a Part 121 carrier, that, just like in any other airline, except that it was non-scheduled, and so it was charter. And there were a number of charter airlines in those days. Nowadays, uh, scheduled carriers also do air charter. They take their airplanes and crews and charter. But in those days, it was... We flew ball teams. We flew various companies. Did they fly the Purdue teams? They, they did. They did. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did that in the DC threes and DC sixes as well. But uh, then it became, as I said, the DC nines and uh, Purdue Airlines operated and maintained Hugh Hefner's bunny jet, the black uh, DC nine with a white bunny on the tail. And so those were all here, and we, we had classes on their systems. We had, um, for simulator training, C-8 link trainers, which are really World War II vintage, and uh, a DC-6 simulator, and a few others. And then, kind of moving along with that, not only did Jim Maris interview me as a student, but then he hired me. Yep, as a right. full-time faculty member, as a temporary first and then a full-time faculty member. Okay. Um, and I've got some other stories I can tell about that either now or later. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, so I went through the program, got the baccalaureate degree, still intended to be an airline pilot. I was going to go fly for American Airlines or for did that, Excuse me, United. did that, when you got your degree, were you certified then to, to fly, or was there some additional work that needed to be No, done? no, I had a commercial pilot certificate, instrument rating, uh, picked up very quickly a multi-engine rating and a flight instructor certificate and, and several ratings on that that I still have and still utilize. Um, but the airlines were not hiring. The economy was down, and they weren't hiring, kind of like it is right now. Um, 
some of my classmates went to the service. I kind of had thought that I would do so because of my father's heritage and my patriotism for my country. But I was at that time married to my wife, and um, our minister came over in April of the year that I graduated, 1967, and had dinner with us. And while my wife was preparing dinner, he and I were talking, and he said, well, you're going to graduate from college. What are you going to do? And I said, well, I guess I'll enlist in the Air Force and be a pilot. And he said, why? And I kind of did a double take, and I said, well, I'm patriotic, and my country needs me. And he said, your country doesn't need me. You, your wife out there does. And I took, I kind of took that to heart, and, and, I, and I thought about it, and it, things have a way of working out. And so about that time, I was looking for a job, and uh, Joe McCormick, who was a faculty member who had been a WASP in World War II, uh, <clears throat> and one of my professors in the simulators, such as they were, had rheumatoid arthritis, as did my mother. And um, she had to have joint replacement. It was very kind of experimental in those days. She had both hips replaced. And so she took the fall semester of 1967 off for sick leave. And Professor Maris hired me as a temporary instructor to teach in the simulators I just graduated from. He was now the head of, he was the, head of the department? Oh, yeah. He was okay. from, a, from, from its inception. Okay. Yep. And so, and that was in 1954-55. Right, that's what I understand. And this was now 1971. And so I took the job, and, um, and Jill, bless her heart, basically adopted my wife and me. And, of course, she'd been in the Air Force Reserve with my dad, the same squadron across town in the Brown Rubber Company building. Uh, and then they subsequently went to um, the old uh, Halsmer Airport and met out there on Wednesday evenings. Well... Okay, so I've got this temporary job, and I walk in, and I'm sure I've filled out some paperwork. Uh, Professor Maris greeted me and uh, got me a key to Jill's office. And then he, he said, okay, and he gave me a handful of regs and a five-gallon bucket of wax. And he said, the students won't be here for a couple of days. The uh, simulators need swept out, and you need to wax them. So I started as a faculty member. My first job was to... To and wax the cleaning squad, <laughs> you bet the uh, the C eight link trainers, and uh, and then in, instruct in them and and just as an ironic aside, our youngest daughter and son in law are at Fort Rucker and he's a controller in the army, and we went to the army museum, uh, uh, army aviation museum at Fort Rucker, and upstairs there is a link trainer. So I have a picture of me this month by a link trainer like I started instructing. <laughs> so that was in the fall of 71. Jill came back. I worked for Reed Airways, which was here on the airport as a full-time flight instructor and a ground instructor. And at one time... What, what, what was uh, Reed Airways? Was it a commercial? Or no, well, it was a fixed base operation, it's okay. called, or an FBO. And in those days, Purdue had the fuel... Um, um, Contractor? Right. They, the, 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 the fuel servicing for aircraft, they did Purdue it itself, and Bill Fleetemeyer ran that and ran the airport. I remember him. I met him a couple, yeah. a couple of times. Because you remember the airport used to have that restaurant out here? Yes, the Skyline. And he used to be out there, and, and I got a chance to meet him because I used to come out here for lunch, and it was just great. Oh, the yeah, whole campus did. Oh, yeah. And you know, that was the nerve center of the airport. People oh, I who bet. People who taught the airline... The FBO, the tower, well, the tower wasn't here then, but the flight service station was, and all the students. Oh, sure. And so there was probably a lot of inaccurate gossip that came out of that, but that's really how everybody knew what everybody else was doing. And then, as you said, on a, on a nice day, people came out from campus in droves because the food was good, the price was right, and you could watch airplanes coming and that going. That was the fun thing, you yeah. know, to eat and look out there, yeah. you know, just yeah. like you're at the airport today, you know, yeah. you're sitting in the rooms. Yeah. yeah. So so I worked for Chuck Reed as a full-time flight instructor, and, and that was in the spring of 1968. Uh, for a period, I was his only full-time instructor, and I also taught ground school. So I would, you know, I, at some days, I would start at, I don't know, 7, 7.30 in the morning, and I wouldn't go home till 1 o'clock at night or the next morning and then be back out. I might have, I might have instructed six or eight students during the day, taught a three-hour ground school, and then gone back out and did a night 
instructional say, a session. Uh, were the students for the Ape Tech? Is that what they're Well, the they, were, they were Purdue students, oh. just as they are with Lafayette Aviation now. Okay. Um, we also had, I think we had both Navy and Air Force ROTC screening. There was a, a cadet program that they paid civilian operators to basically get them almost through a private pilot certificate and make sure they had aptitude, didn't get air sick, that kind of thing. Okay. So we did that. Um, That's a full schedule. It is. Yeah. And if you know if you know Bob Zink, well, Bob Zink was an instructor for Chuck as well, is even though a full-time math professor. So Bob and I have been friends since spring of 1968. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, and then in August of 19... Excuse me, I thought it would have been 1972 that Bob and I met. Um, in August of 1972, there was an opening for an instructor, full-time instructor position at Hangar 6 to teach in the small airplanes. And so I applied for that. Jim Maris, bless his heart, hired me again. And um, so I instructed in the uh, piston fleet and started teaching in the ground schools for pilot like certification. Teaching. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, and there's another little piece to that. I, I started there, and I two things happened that are pivotal, I think, to my still being here, among others. One was that I started teaching the instrument ground school, and I became, I, I was doing a lot of instrument instructing as well. And I, in teaching the instrument ground school and weather flying, I had had a weather course uh, that I took from Bob Dale. And uh, in agronomy, and it was a survey of meteorology course a friend and I took, and it became later a requirement in the flight curriculum. And I was going to get while I was waiting on that airline job, I was going to get a master's degree in business. But I took a course in uh, entrepreneurship; it was an excellent course. But I just that wasn't my niche. So I was looking around for something else to do, and I thought, you know, I really enjoyed that weather course from Professor Dale. I'm going to go see him. And he remembered me. He liked having the Flyboys in his class, and we were the only two. And and uh, the bottom line was he said, sure, I'll work with you. And I got an aviation climatology master's degree in agronomy through Bob Dale and Ag Meteorology. And then I developed nice a... Nice compliment, yeah, to what yeah, you did before. Uh, and then I became passionate about the atmosphere. And I developed what I've called a, a lifelong, a, a career-long love affair with the atmosphere, love-hate relationship, I guess. And uh, so about that same time, uh, two professors, um, Hannes Thompson from uh, electrical engineering and Bob Squires from chemical engineering, were uh, I had gotten them both their private pilot certificates when I was still at Hangar 6. And uh, we had really hit it off well, and they flew with uh, Jim Blakesley and others um, in the Purdue Staff Aero Flying Club. And they kind of, they, the club, kind of adopted me as, a, as an adjunct instructor for them and their, their membership. And so I would fly checkouts and that kind of thing. And so Bob and Hannes asked me to get them their instrument ratings. And they said, uh, can we take your instrument ground school? I said, sure. So they were in my lecture class, and then at night and on weekends, we would fly with us in a staff aero airplane. One would sit in back while I instructed the first one, and then we'd stop and switch, and I'd do the same lesson with the other one watching. And as I worked with them, I'll never forget this. Uh, one day at the conclusion of a class session in the uh, instrument ground school I said you know you guys and, and they're younger than I am now they were younger then than I am now they were probably close to 50 which to me was pretty old in those days I said you know for for two guys your age you really act young and Hannes well maybe one of the two or maybe both of them they kind of smiled and looked at each other and they, one of them said you know if you work with young people it keeps you young and the more I reflected on that, the more it was clear to me that my calling was here. And so I gave up on the idea of going to the airlines and um, decided to get that doctorate because even in those days, I felt that, that was really my union card. 
and I really needed to finish it. Plus, I had that passion. Um, and that wasn't easy because I was working full time. I was a half time grad student, and my wife and I started our family, and so we had. I read something that you really it took a while. Yeah. That's a big load. Yeah. A big job. Yeah. yeah. So it did take a while, but. Um, then Persistence paid off. I know, and you finally got it. Yeah. You're so pleased. Yeah. yeah. And about that time, another pivotal thing happened in my career uh, when Dr. Bering came. Uh, because Dr. Bering, he's been such a role model for me. He's like a father to me. Um, Had you met him before he came here? Or? No. Oh, okay. No. Um, and being the dyed in the wool boiler that I am, and when I thought that we've got a, we've got a president coming from IU, I thought, what's wrong with these trustees, you know? Little did I realize until I really got to know him how wonderful he is, and sure. uh, and Mrs. Beering, and and they are like family to us, and uh, still. But he was so good for aviation technology and for the entire university. But but he understood having been in the Air Force, understood pilots. He liked airplanes. He liked and us. He'd been involved in the early uh, astronaut program yes. down there, and really yes. And had it not been for Dr. Beering, my my whole career would have been profoundly different. But because he bought the uh, the King Air airplanes, and then later the first jet, and then the second jet, and the the newer King Airs that were still operating, because of his vision and because of his um, strength as an administrator, I think to make things happen when they weren't always popular, because they were the right thing to do. Um, and he foresaw that and realized it as well. Yeah. And um, so we we got turbine airplanes that have, for over a quarter of a century, have served the travel needs of the university community. And I think, uh, you know, I've, uh, Dr. Mason, when she was provost, told me one time that, you know, when we're after a, a dean, you guys complete the sale. Because if we pick somebody that we really want and we send you to bring them and their family up, for the final discussions, and then you take them home in that jet airplane, they're hooked. Because what's, what's the shelf life normally on your planes now, on the jets? Well, well do, do, do you turn it? Is it the mileage? No, it uh, actually. I into that because I I sometimes raise that question in my mind about cars. How long? You know, sometimes I've I've kept them for quite a while. Uh, like I had a Pontiac that was more than probably ten or eleven, and it just. I didn't have many problems with it. Of course, it didn't have a lot of heavy driving, I should say. Well, the thing about an airplane, an airplane has to be maintained by law with a very stringent set of standards and a, a stringent protocol that's established by the FAA and the manufacturer. Okay. So it's really kept in essentially, in one sense, almost new condition all the time. Sure. The thing, uh, the thing that an airplane like the ones I'm describing has, it has cycles and in particular pressurization cycles. We just test flew an airplane this morning that, that we may be able to get. It's a jet airplane. It has, um, I think it's 35,000 cycles or 35,000 hours, whichever comes first. It's got a long life. Um, the King Air that we have, the King Airs, I think their pressure vessel has a 10,000 hour life because every time you pressurize it, even though it's metal, it expands and then it depressurizes, it almost Impressed. deflates. Yeah. And that constant motion eventually wears anything out. And so, you know, realistically, those airplanes that we're operating are still excellent and in excellent, excellent shape. Yeah. But almost what happens instead is that their, their systems or their avionics, their electronics, become so aged and, yeah. and uh, so and that's, old. That's the key today is the yeah. electronics. Right? And if, if you could have gone with me on the airplane that I flew this morning, along with two colleagues, and seen the avionics on it, they're spectacular. They're absolutely spectacular. Well, it's like the cars, too, you know, yeah. all the bells and whistles. Yeah. And uh, when we get off, I'll tell you what happened on my car recently when the light went on. <laughs> 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 oh, uh, that's, that's nice, though. Yeah. And, and I think your point that you're saying about taking the people from and to and from, it affects the same thing when you have a colleague come. A lot depends on how you interact with the, with the individual and you do, and sometimes you get, and it's, I've often said to colleagues when we bring candidates in, 
they're looking at us just like we're looking at them. Oh, sure. And some people don't seem to get the message. Yeah. And we always felt that we were in, you know, I was director of operations, if you will, then, and or chief pilot of that part. Sure. And we tried to always be sure that we, we were really the, um, the extension of the university. We were ambassadors to the university, and so we always tried to leave a good impression. Right. And, um, and that's really key. Yeah. Really key. In the old days, we would go pick up uh, potential student athletes. Nowadays, the rules have changed, so we don't <laughs> do it that much. But I've gotten to know a lot of uh, very you. good student athletes. You know, and I'll tell you a little bit, just a little uh, yeah. other people we've had the honor of flying. So that's that's kind of how I stayed here. And, and Bill Duncan, uh, Jim Maris was uh, injured in a, an auto accident, and basically that led to his retirement from the department head position. And that was in 1981, <clears throat> nine years after I'd started full time. And uh, I still didn't have my PhD, and I had my master's degree, and I had done a. But you were starting to work on the PhD. After oh yeah, I was I was sure. underway. Right. And and I there was a, an incident with one of our transportation airplanes that was the the pilot the captain felt was weather related and Bill knew that I was I'd already had a master's degree in it and I was working on a doctorate and he asked me to do a study and I guess working with him in that way he really liked what he saw so when he became department head he asked me to come over and serve in essence as an I was an an administrative assistant because I was still working on my doctorate. Okay. So he couldn't call me assistant department head, but I did a lot of that. Once I got my doctorate, then I started up the academic rank of assistant, associate, full professor, and uh, that happened in fairly short order, really, and I became the assistant department head and then subsequently the associate department head. So that would have been from about 1984 to um, well, ultimately, till I became department head in 2002, but probably the associate head, you know, for a long period all of time. 12, 13 right. years anyway. What were your primary responsibilities with that uh, as the associate? Well, early on, it was uh, a lot of what Bill had done as the assistant department head. So at one time, I was the chief academic advisor for the department. In those days, faculty were advisors, and so the faculty had their groups of advisees, but I coordinated and interfaced with the university and the college, in those days the school. Um, when we decided we wanted to do an internship and co-op program that fell to me as a scheduled deputy. As part of being scheduled deputy, and in those days we did it with a piece of pieces of paper. I had sheaves of colored paper. Nowadays you do it all electronically, of course. Know, but but uh, I did that, and uh, in those days Purdue had yellow school bus, or gold maybe, school buses. I scheduled the bus runs for our students. Uh, still taught. A lot on your plate. Did you, were you involved with the graduate program as well? Well, in those days we didn't have one. Oh, okay. And I don't even think the School of Technology did. Well, the School of Technology did. It was in what's now industrial technology okay. because it was industrial arts teaching. Okay. And that was the only one that we had. Yeah. What, uh, pro what prompted you decide to go on to, the, to offer a graduate program? Was that while you were head or was it before? Uh, actually, that had started. Um, it might have started at, at the very end of Bill Duncan's department head tenure or just after that when Mike Cruz was the department head for five years. Mike and I, Jim Maris had gotten injured in a car accident. Bill Duncan had to step down because he was injured in a motorcycle accident, tragically. Mike and I, Mike Cruz and I were co-department heads for a year under Don Gentry and then I decided I was having too much fun flying and being an associate head so I didn't apply for the department head position full time that Mike did and uh, was department head for five years. I was his associate head and became department head for six years on my own. But about that time and during Mike's tenure, we began doing graduate coursework and having our grad students, but they, it has always been under the College of Technology, which has been a technology master's degree. We've had uh, several uh, PhD students that we've done in a similar way through the college. And uh, one, I think one of the most important things that I did as a department head was to try to 
really more formalize it, and uh, I uh, selected a, an associate department head for graduate education, Dick Fanjoy, who's just done a spectacular job. A year ago, we had probably uh, 12 students. Now we've got 30. Probably in two years, we'll have 60. And our uh, new department head, uh, Dr. Bowen, would like to have 120 or more and would like to start it. Both a master's and a PhD. Right. Okay. And he's talked with me and another colleague to, to see about Go us ahead. having the start of the PhD. Okay. So, you know, as part of the evolution of the College of Technology, uh, for so long, all we did was teach. And nowadays at an R1 institution, it's appropriate if you're there to do research like your colleagues across campus, and we're doing that. And That's right, exactly. It's, you don't do re I don't think you can really have graduate programs without research, and you can't really do research very well, I don't think, without graduate right. students. So they come hand in hand. Yeah, good point. Uh, one thing I did want to ask you that was on the, that airway science weather lab, and particularly because you mentioned Dr. Baring, and I, the thing I read that David Baring did some of the uh, scripts for that. Yes. Uh, Airway Science was a program from the FAA. The, administ the FAA administrator in those years was Lynn Helms, and he saw the need for better educated practitioners, pilots, mechanics, whatever, managers. And so he developed the concept of an Airway Science program. That's been supplanted with something else that I'm working very closely with now that's an accreditation program, but we didn't have it in those days. And so he also was very smart in coming up with grant money. If you were an airway science approved program, you were eligible for grant money. And I can remember some conferences where we couldn't get a room big enough for standing room only because all the collegiate aviation educators around the country, colleagues that really weren't that interested in coming to the conferences before there was money in it now big money some people got or some institutions got buildings all kinds of things so I put one in for us and with my weather background uh, it was to be a teaching lab and an operational lab and in those days there weren't that many weather vendors like there are now and it used to, most everything used to come on teletype paper well, this was the advent, you know, the, the mid-80s, I guess, of more and more smaller scale desktop computing, Unix machines, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and I had uh, gotten to know and be friends with David Bering, who's Dr. Bering's middle son, middle of three. And Donna Bering, his wife, went through our program and is a United Airlines captain. She and flies? She does. And David and Donna and my wife and I became just like a family, and we still are. We don't get to see them enough anymore because they're very busy in Chicago, but, but um, we just became very, very close. And when I got this grant, the things I had proposed to do needed some really serious computer programming skills. Well, David is, uh, the word expert doesn't get high enough with what he is still. And uh, so David, just being the great guy and a great friend that he is, on weekends, Saturday nights, just down the hall, we'd start at 8 o'clock after dinner. Um, I don't even know if Dave and Donna were married then. Donna may have come over and just was she spent time with my time wife. Well? Uh, I think she might have been. Oh, okay. Yeah, she probably was. She was mm -hmm. probably finishing then because David was still working on his master's degree. So she probably was, just about to finish herself. So David and I would come out, and we'd work till one or two in the morning, programming this Unix machine and making it take weather data that that were available online, but coming in a data stream. David put on a program that just listened and said, "Well, that's got this characteristic, and that's got that characteristic," and based on that, he programmed it so that when it came across with a data stream, it said, "Oh, it's this kind of information that goes into that file." It took somebody like David to do that, and uh, we just became closer and closer. We put a, we had a, uh, an airborne radar, surplus radar. I wanted to teach radar, so we just took it upon ourselves to find a place up on the roof. So we were up on the roof 
nowadays you'd probably be arrested or shot <laughs> or shot and then arrested but things were a lot different then so on, sure. on a weekend sunny afternoon like in the summertime whatever we'd be up on the roof doing things super and uh, Oh, a nice thing. It worked out well for you. Then. Yeah. Yeah. And I had this indicated some, but you've got quite a few gifts, and you have addressed those that you've gotten over the time. Um, that uh, one I did want to ask about was that United Airlines Boeing that Neil Armstrong brought, and you yeah. got that 727. Yeah. Do you remember that one? This is a the uh, number one throttle or thrust lever handle from that, and I've also got here in the office the yoke that he used, we preserved that. Uh, another professor and I uh, thought, you know, before they chew that airplane up, we need to preserve some things. Sure. But uh, United wanted to, they gave several universities surplus 727s. They really, <coughs> they couldn't sell them. They weren't, there. the engines were so, uh, well, they're noisy, they're, they're not, the proper stage engines and so you couldn't use them in the United States and they couldn't sell them overseas so they they were worth more if they could give them away and take the tax write off. Sure. So we arranged, Bill Duncan was the department head then and uh, we said sure we'll take it and they graciously said uh, we'll paint it for you and uh, I'll never forget by this time we had the diamond jet that Dr. Bering had helped us get and uh, so I got a call from my sister-in-law who said, hey, I saw your airplane in Denver today. I was through Denver on an airline. And I said, no, you didn't. She said, yes, I did. I said, dear, you couldn't have the airplane. I know our jet was sitting in a hangar all day today. And she said, well, it said pretty university on it. And I said, oh, and it was that airplane because after United said, we'll give it to you, and they painted it in our little golden black, they said, oh, we've got to do uh, ground de-icing tests. We need an airplane. We need your airplane through the winter in Denver to do tests for de-icing. So, indeed, she saw our airplane. We were just talking about two different airplanes. So then the time came to fly it in, and um, they arranged, because Neil Armstrong was both on our board and United Airlines board, he was, in fact, he's the one that got us for us, I'm sure. And so he was going to be on board along with some other dignitaries. And they, they ended up having their most senior engineering test pilots fly there as the crew on it because the airplane was out of license. It had sat in Denver. You know, airplanes have to be inspected, as I mentioned earlier, with a very strict protocol, uh, either flight time or time since last yeah, inspection. Right. And uh, it had sat so long it was out of license. It wasn't current and it needed to be inspected unless it was flown on a ferry permit. And a ferry permit is a special authorization for flight from the FAA for valid reason to take an airplane somewhere to get worked on. Well, they were going to bring it to here to be worked on. They were going to bring it here to never fly again. So they said, okay, and they gave them a ferry permit. Well, with a ferry permit, it's normally because the airplane, by definition, hasn't been inspected. You don't know if it meets the maintenance requirements, air, airworthiness requirements. It's supposed to be an essential crew only. Well, they piled a vice president, his staff, and I think Neil Armstrong probably from Denver, and this crew, and I don't know who else, and they flew it to Indianapolis, and it's only supposed to go one place so theoretically, it should have just been stuck in Indianapolis, but they flew it to Indianapolis, and then they had, I think, the mayor and the governor and uh, Dr. Beering and, uh, and Bill Duncan and I forget, and, and uh, oh, uh, I'm trying to think. Don Gentry. You know, it was probably right? Dan, uh, Don was, uh, yeah, he was uh, dean then, Don Gentry, and I, I forget who else. Yeah. An entourage of about 30 people when they weren't supposed to carry anybody. And... Uh, and I was here waiting with um, hundreds of other people and so then after their speeches in Indianapolis they piled everybody on and flew it up here and ironically one of our graduates one of my former students was an assistant manager at the flight standards office for the FAA in Indianapolis and she said with her boss there 
Uh, she said, wait a minute, this is on a ferry permit. They can't, they can't do that, can they? And I think her boss looked at her and like, are, are you really going to bring this up? Don't bring this up. And, oh, okay. So I piled everybody on the airplane. Were you here when it arrived? No, I wasn't. I okay. Know, but I remember well, hearing we're all standing over there. and, and I've seen the picture. I've seen so the picture. They, Neil Armstrong is now flying the airplane. He's the world's most famous pilot and a complex pilot extraordinaire. But I don't think he's got a type rating in a 727. So add to that that he's flying the airplane with passengers in back on a ferry permit. And they, they bring it down. The tower just says the airspace is all yours. Nobody else is flying. There's an airspeed limit of 200 knots, and I think they were doing at least 250. I don't know. They brought it down, kind of like a fighter pass with the gear up, brought it up, did a fighter turn, brought it back around, did another fighter approach, was having so much fun. They did another low pass, brought it up, did another turn. Because, and I think it's because, A, he was having a lot of fun, and B, no pilot really ever likes to take an airplane that and land it knowing it will never fly again. And I think that probably weighed on his mind, although I never asked him about it. And brought it down, gear comes down, the flaps come down, and he touches down like a small airplane. It was perfect. Held the nose off, and they taxi up, you know, and we have our pleasantries here. And that was a grand day. And one of my tasks, ironically, as a department head, was to because uh, FedEx wanted to give us another airplane kind of under similar circumstances. A lot less pomp and circumstance, I guess, but uh, that one was flown in. It was still legal to fly just on its own. It was flown by an all Purdue crew. These were all kids that I'd had in my class. I saw that picture. Yeah. That's really, I was going to ask you that's about That's really special. Really nice. Yeah, that's, and the picture view is good. Yeah, that's really special. Yeah. So, so they brought it in. They brought it in early. I wanted to bring it in like we did the same thing when we were going to dedicate it. But they had an engine. One of the engines was going to be out of time at the end of August of that year, and they weren't going to be able to do the dedication. We weren't until September. So they said, uh, we need to bring it out there because otherwise we're going to have to bring another engine up and, or we're going to have to put another engine on it. That's expensive. We don't want to do that. Sure. So we said, okay. So they brought it up, and then we ceremoniously taxied it in. You know, but uh, that presented a problem because we don't have any ramp space for three airliners. So the only way I could accept that 727 and keep the the 737 was to get rid of the United, the old United 727. And if nobody likes to bring an airplane down that's never going to fly again. No pilot alive likes to cut one up. It just, it's right. a terrible thing. But I didn't have any choice. So with Betty Stanbury's excellent help and a lot of other good people, we had to go through more hoops. I mean, it's university state property. you got to go through all that. Hoop. <laughs> then you've got to, it's, it's got hazardous substances. It's got hydraulic fluid, and it's got jet fuel, and it's got... As it turns out, some 727s have uranium, spent uranium as weights up on the tail. So it could have been radioactive. And we got to get rid of all this stuff. But we got it done. And uh, Oscar Winsky graciously cut it up and carried it away if we let them have the salvage value of the metal in it. So we did that, but we kept some things. That's good. <laughs> Uh, well, you talked about administration. That's kind of good. I was going to ask you, um, in the department heads, you've, had, you've mentioned that. Um, what was the impact on that crash in September of '97 when it was student? Oh, it's terrible. Um, terrible for all of us personally, of course, and the families. <coughs> well, you, you were here at the time. Oh, yeah. Occurred. Yeah, I was the associate department head. And, uh, and went down there. Don Gentry and I stood down there while they were investigating it with the students still there, did, but still on the airplane. And we stayed there. I wasn't going to leave until the kids were gone. And uh, so we stood there together on the longest day of my life. Uh, 
I still remember it was a day, a nice clear day, and uh, I remember our, when I heard the news, I agree with you. Our, uh, I had just stepped out of my office down the hall, and our director of simulator maintenance came running down the hall. He said, we just had an airplane go down. And I, I said, I couldn't believe my ears. And he said, yeah. I said, look out the window. And I looked out the window, and you could see the fire and the black smoke. And, I, you know, you think, oh, no. And I said, are you sure it was one of ours? And he said, yeah, I think it was. And the young man that was the instructor. Had it taken off, or was yeah. it going to take off? Yeah, it took off. And he was doing his, he was doing multi-engine instructing, and you fail engines on purpose to teach the students how to deal with that. <clears throat> and I think what happened was the student was a big, big guy, burly guy, and I, he he pushed on the wrong rudder pedal and pulled back, and he stalled it. And when you do that with asymmetric thrust, the airplane's going to spin. So it entered a spin at an altitude that nobody could recover from. It just augured straight in. Uh, they were killed instantly, but uh, which was good because the airplane burned. I mean, if it had to happen, it, at least they didn't have to right. burn to death. Uh, and the FAA assured us of that because of their of their injuries. But uh, you know, I saw it. And Mike Mike Cruz was the department head, uh, and Mike said, "Go on down, and I'll deal with the press and whatever up here, and you can take care of it down there." So I did. I spent the day with with Don. The, as I started to say, the instructor was very close to me personally. He had flown the, the diamond jet that we had. He was one of the special group, and uh, just the nicest young man. Was he married? Did he have a family? Oh, well, he was engaged. Uh, and his parents, I came to know his parents really well. And, uh, they're just the nicest people. Very happy to have heard yeah. um, that. Of course, the other one is that now you have that. Uh, you have the air. Well, you've been doing a lot of air traffic controller programs that been at Purdue for some time. Well, we have. Uh, yeah. We have. We're one of the um, collegiate training initiative schools from the FAA, and it's um, the FAA, at least so far, has never given up their own training process at their academy in Oklahoma City. So this is kind of a. It's a. It's an educational preparation program that that we are especially um, certificate is not the right word but authorized as a school to offer right and our students have um, some special privileges for interviewing and they've done it exceptionally well uh, Mike Nolan on our faculty who was the interim head last year wrote the book on air traffic control as a former air traffic controller and when they get through with Professor Nolan they know their stuff and the FAA knows that and uh, so it's it's that preparation